America's only Irish station, Radio Irish. That's what you're listening to. Sean McCarthy here, and we're delighted to welcome Emmy and Peabody Award-winning film and television producer, writer, director and author, Melissa Jo Peltier, to Radio Irish. How are you, Melissa? I'm wonderful. I'm wonderful. And you? Well, I'm grand here, Melissa, and what a pleasure to welcome you to Radio Irish. Well, you have a brand new novel out titled Reality Boulevard, which follows fictional Oscar-winning producer Marty Maltzman, whose award-winning non-fiction TV show is suddenly cancelled after 16 seasons. Now, in your novel, the quirky documentary filmmaker and his colourful staff suddenly find themselves unemployed and out on the streets in an artificial new Hollywood, filled with Kardashians, survivors and real housewives. As the collection of oddball characters adapt to a surreal world in which the lines between truth and lies are blurred, both on and off the screen, your story, Melissa, reveals an insider's view of Hollywood and reality TV. Tell me, what triggered this novel in you, Melissa? What made you want to expose what lurks behind the reality TV show? Well, um, the first, uh, there's a scene in the novel where Marty Maltzman, who you mentioned, who is a, uh, an Oscar-winning producer who's had this kind of a, a heroic show on the air for 16 years and then it gets canceled. He's been... Leaves this situation and decides he has to try to sell a new show. But of course, the kind of shows that are being sold on the air and being bought on the air are very different now than they were 16 years ago. So he's in a meeting with uh, two very young 20 something executives, and they're saying things to him like, Well, dwarves are doing very well for us, and do you know any celebrity friends of yours who have hit bottom? Because we really like that kind of show. And it's it's surreal. I mean, he can't believe they're saying these things. It reads like satire, but the truth is that scene is actually taken almost word for word from a, a combination of meetings that I've actually been in, where executives sat there and said things like, you know, uh, um, you know, we're, we're really looking for some just you know overweight middle aged men who are poor with no teeth. I mean, <laughs> the, the kind of the kind of things they were asking for. It made me sit up in this meeting and think, what am I doing here? I actually got into television to tell good stories that would make people's lives better. And I've been in television a long time. And at the same time, you know, I've always wanted to sort of write about my experiences in television and some of the interesting, colorful, quirky people I've met along the way. And, again, my novel reads like a satire, but the truth is it's so close to to documentary. It's kind of ridiculous. Um, you have to have a sense of absurdist humor to work in TV sometimes because uh, the situations that, that crop up. And you know, I've had a really long, colorful career, and I, I wanted to write about it, the good and the bad. But I'm also very critical, I would have to say. I'm not, I'm not a crusader against reality TV, but uh, I just really believe that a lot of the images it's portraying are hurting, actually hurting people and hurting society. And I wanted to kind of shine a light on that. Well, your novel, Reality Boulevard, has been described by Academy Award and 16-time Emmy Award winner, producer Arnold Shapiro, as, quote, the best satirical look behind the scenes of reality television ever written. That's high praise coming from Shapiro, Melissa. So when a giant like Arnold Shapiro gives your novel such resounding praise... Considering your storyline is somewhat cynical of the direction that reality TV has taken the television production industry, what does that say about the choices that Hollywood is making these days, Melissa? Well, you know, Hollywood is as a business. As there's a saying in Hollywood, it's show business, not show friend. <laughs> and and it's a business first and foremost. It always has been. It's never been an art before a business. Uh, it's a business that relies on content creators and artists. And what business people want and what artists want have, you know, traditionally through history always been somewhat at odds. So, you know, you, you can't put the blame on Hollywood for being bad or negative. Hollywood uh, saw in reality TV a profit center, uh, a quite an easy profit center, and they saw they could get viewers. 
So uh, the problem is, in any situation in Hollywood, it's a very reactive industry. So it's much harder to get something on the air or a movie made that's different than something has ex- that has succeeded before. Um, it, it's possible, and usually when that happens, something's different, it takes off, and then suddenly everyone wants to do things exactly like what was once different. So that's the way the business works. There's no, you know, good or bad about it. It's just how it works. And with reality TV, once the first reality TV shows started to sort of up the ante in what was acceptable, that, that bar had to be raised more and more and more to get more attention. Um, so the, the idea in reality TV is every week has to have a lot of conflict and a lot of sort of outrageousness. And that's not natural. That doesn't happen in real life. So you have to manufacture it. And that, to me, is, is kind of the problem with reality TV, is it, it, it's been accepted now that we just manufacture what happens on it, and it's, it's not the same thing as writing drama. It's very different, and it ends up falling into stereotypes, and the kind of stereotypes that are presented as real, which people watching, especially young people, tend to internalize as acceptable behavior, no matter how outrageous or negative it is. Now, you yourself, Melissa, are a hugely respected television producer with a a glowing career in the film and TV production industry, which has earned you two Emmys, a Peabody, and other awards for your work on documentary TV specials, non-fiction programming, and reality shows such as Dog Whisperer with Cesar Milan, which was hugely successful. So you know the industry inside out. Tell me, Melissa, going back to the start, what has happened here with reality television? How did reality TV sort of push all sorts of other programming out of the way? How did that all begin? Um, well, I think the novelty and the creativity of early reality TV. I mean, I have to, I have to say that the early reality TV uh, pioneers were very creative. MTV's Real World started out as something that those of us who really enjoy the documentary form were excited about because it really was, we thought it was going to be like an American family. We thought it was going to be, wow, you know, we're really following these people. And I think the early seasons of Real World were very true to that. Uh, it was incredibly well done and really compelling. And they cast it well. They chose really good original people. As the, as the seasons went on, it became more and more contrived, which is unfortunately the the problem with reality TV. It's like a drug. Uh, you know, the more drama there is in one season, there's got to be more in the next season and more in the next season. And again, life and people just aren't like that without some falsifying. Um, somebody said to me, a, a pretty successful doctor who I know, said to me recently how much he really feels he would be a great reality TV show because he has done some just miraculous things with people who have chronic pain. I mean, he's had miraculous, miraculous cures. And, I, and, and he's been saying that to me for, for a long time and, you know, trying to get me to, you know, will you look at my, my situation? And, you know, and he thinks he'd be perfect for reality TV. And I said to him, you know, well, do you perform a miracle every week? And he said, well, no. And I said, well, then you'd have to fake it. And he said, well, I wouldn't do that. <laughs> well, then you're, that rules you out. <laughs> you know, um, the, the situation is not based on reality, and that's, that's, excuse me, that's why we have drama. You know, that's why the Greek playwrights started writing plays. It's, it's a way to, drama is a way to take conflict and, and uh, uh, all those things that are, are do happen, but to condense it and control it in a way. And what reality TV has started to do is to condense and control what they claim is reality, which is farther and farther from reality. And again, so it's really manipulating the audience. That's fine. The audience knows they're being manipulated. But reality TV is, is even though 25% of people who watch reality TV say they don't believe any of it's real, but that leaves a lot of other people who do. And, again, um, you know, when I was thinking about this book, I don't think I would have the view of reality TV that I have now if 
I still lived in Hollywood. I moved uh, 10 years ago to, I married a Brooklyn boy, Brooklyn Irish boy, <laughs> and I moved to, uh, to, to Nyack, New York, which is a small town. And uh, we were raising my stepdaughter, who grew, you know, is she and her friends grew up in a small town watching reality TV. They didn't know a world without reality TV. And I saw how it influenced them outside of Hollywood, despite the fact that her father was a filmmaker and I was a filmmaker. Um, most of her life was a very small town life. And, and it was frightening to see how it influenced these girls. It was really frightening. I would never have had that perspective had I been still living in L.A. And, uh, and that made me a lot more critical of what people were doing, and it also made me, um, you know, not want to go a certain direction in the kind of work I was doing because uh, television is really powerful, and especially, again, for, for children and teenagers whose critical faculties aren't fully developed and for adults who aren't aware of the manipulation that goes on. Now, there's a fun video doing the circuit called I Can't Believe These Are All TV Shows, which we can watch on your website, www.melissajopeltier.com. Yes, it's on my blog. <laughs> yes, that's right. That's the one. And it features an almost nauseating rundown through some of television's more ludicrous reality TV shows. And, you know, watching the video, I couldn't help but think that it, it seems to me these days any old idea for a reality TV show might actually score a budget with some of these show backers and investors. Is it a case, Melissa, of who you know these days with respect to, you know, securing a production budget rather than what idea you might have for a show? How much of it is who you know? Um... You know, it's funny. I was I was actually just came back from a a Discovery ID series pilot that I was shooting in Vermont, Northern Vermont, which was really fun. And Discovery ID is um, I love Discovery ID, <laughs> and a lot of people do. By the way, it's it's becoming insanely popular. It's all sort of investigation, crime, uh, uh, forensics all the time, and um, it's. Old school. It's the sort of stuff I started out doing. It's it's reenactments, interviews, investigations. It's not um, you know stage reality, docu soap, that sort of thing. Um, and we were covering a murder up in northern Vermont, and it was a really surreal situation. But I was talking to uh, the cameraman who I've known for you know a couple decades now, and we were just. Deciding, you know, what what does sell? Because he's got a friend right now who who is selling. You know, he's basically he can write something on a napkin and sell it to a network. And I think there is a um, there is a. And this happens, by the way, this happens in drama too. This happens in movies too. Uh, there's sort of the hot person of the moment. So there's sort of the hot showrunner, the hot executive producer, the hot production company of the moment. And, um, you know, for whatever reason, the networks have successes with them, and they want to keep working with them. So they're more likely to buy shows from them. So there's that, that is part of the, um, the phenomenon. But there's also the type of shows that networks are looking for. If you can fit into what they're looking for at that moment, um, your show might sell. Uh, and the, the situation with that is... Um, the moment changes from week to week. I mean, I do get updates still on what networks are looking for, and, and it changes from week to week. And you will get, you know, one network saying, we are no longer looking for docu-soaps, we're looking for uh, competition shows. And then a month later, you will have them saying, we're desperate for docu-soaps. So it's really a lot of what networks are looking for is what is working for them today. And, uh, of course... You know, in terms of who you know, yeah, if a production company happens to be really good at a certain type of show, uh, they'll call them back and say, can you do this another one for me? And, you know, that makes sense from a network point of view. I, I think I, if I were on the network side, I would that would make sense with me rather than trying an untried uh, uh, entity. So I don't think there's anything uh, – and, and Hollywood's always been like that. You know, you tend to – I mean, you know, how many how many shows can Jerry Bruckheimer produce? But he's a proven entity, right? No? So um, that's, uh, uh, you, you'll see right now in television, um, especially in the, the high-end cable dramas, you're getting more and more feature people 
being brought in to do those, which is, is frustrating for television people who really want to to go that route um, because they they want to do something different than networks will allow them to do. But um, but feature people have sort of started to monopolize that area, and that's also because feature people are creatively they're known quali- quantities. Um, often there there's a problem with that in that feature people are not used to television budgets and schedules, which are, um, you know, grueling compared to feature budgets, unless you're doing low-budget features. Uh, they're, they're, it's a very different manner of working, even though the storytelling is the same. Uh, but um, so sometimes feature people just, you know, really, once they've experienced that, they, they don't, they want to go back to features. But, but television allows you, especially, um, you know, I always say that the, the problem with really bad reality TV that's all over the networks is that it's forced really good drama to kind of go somewhere else. My, my, what I was trying to do in the novel was to kind of just raise a little awareness of these, these, the collateral damage of this kind of programming because I know from, from my own experience that when you're in the middle of it, you're, just con- you're concerned with make- getting it sold, number one. Then you're concerned with getting it made, number two. You know, then you're concerned with it getting ratings, number three. And you forget. I think some of the best people in the world with the best intentions forget what the power is of this medium that they're working in every day when they're really concerned with you know, paying their mortgage and, and, and getting their next show sold, etc., um, they forget how powerful that this goes out to so many people in their homes and, and the living situations that they that people in Hollywood can't even imagine. I was just in a community in northern Vermont. There's a lot of poverty that you know people working two minimum wage jobs who still have to exist on food stamps and and because there's just no jobs and people don't have the gas money to drive two three mile two three hours to to where the jobs are and uh, it's. You know, America has a lot of pockets that people in Hollywood don't think about when they're programming. Well, like everything, Melissa, in film and television, only the strong survive, and strength comes from viewership figures, of course. So obviously, reality television has somehow earned its place on our screens, what with people choosing to watch this stuff, however dreadful most of it is. But its very presence has also put a lot of people out of work, including great television actors who one day were all over our screens, but who are now seemingly finding it tough going to to eke out a living, doing things like trade shows and sci-fi conferences and so on. It's as if Hollywood has kind of forgotten some of its own people and has turned its back on the very people who made Hollywood what what it once was famous for. Where are all these television actors, Melissa, that we have loved so much over the years? How could they possibly be surviving uh, without work? Well, I think, you know, I think the problem is less for actors, although I think part of the reason that you'll see so many celebrities who are maybe, I don't know, (laughs) C-list celebrities, um, and I'm not talking, you know, comedians like Kathy Griffin, who did an amazing reality show, by the way, really creative and wonderful uh, and entertaining and not, not exploitative. I mean, you know, she's a comedian, so you have people like her or they don't. But, but um, there are a lot of, of act, former actors or former, you know, people who've had a small amount of, of success in that area who you'll see turning up, you know, on some of these reality shows, um, I don't know, Dancing with the Stars. Um, uh, they're doing, you know, they're 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 doing reality docu soaps about their lives, and you wonder what, you know, why are they doing this? And it's because they want to keep in the public eye, because you know, celebrity is a is a business as well as acting is a business, and they want to keep in the public eye, and they want they don't want to be marginalized, and. Um, but is it not a case that there's simply no other work for them? Yeah, I, I you know, I, the problem with Hollywood is there's not, there's not less work for actors. I don't think that's the case, because there's certainly a lot of great drama. Um, I mean, I think actors are just as busy as they ever were. Writers, you know, I mean, I have a whole spiel about how I'm, I'm terrified about uh, the situation with writers and the non-union productions, um, and even directors, although directors are going to be the last to, to fall to that. But, um, 
but yeah, I mean, one problem also is that you know reality stars aren't SAG, Screen Actors Guild. They a lot of them end up joining because of some of the different things that they do, but but because the the shows are called unscripted, which they're not. Very important to believe. You know, soft scripted is a term, which I think is hilarious. Soft scripted. Actually, that was the first title of my novel. But um, soft scripted means it's not really written, but it sort of is. And it's not written by writers because you can't call them writers because then the Writers Guild will start complaining. So we'll call them story producers or story associates or uh, uh, you know anything that doesn't that isn't an official Writers Guild title, and and they're basically writing the stories, and they're writing this the season arc, and they're doing what you would do in a dramatic show, but they're not getting credit for it. They're not getting health insurance or pension and welfare or Writers Guild protection. You know, collective bargaining and all those things that that the guilds do for us who, you know, we work job to job. People don't really think about that also in Hollywood. I tried to show that in my novel um, that, you know, Hollywood is primarily, you know, there's there's a, a number of people in Hollywood who are fabulously wealthy and they run things, but the majority of people in Hollywood are middle class to upper middle class. Uh, they're uh, creative people and they're also technical people. And they work incredibly hard, incredibly long hours. Uh, They live very basic, humble, you know, standard middle-class American lives in an expensive city. Los Angeles is a very expensive city, so a lot of them live outside the city, uh, just like New York. And they work job to job. So you can be on a series... Uh, my husband created this series, The Ghost Whisperer, and that was on the air for five years. And, you know, the, the people that work on that, that series, from the, you know, the people who work on lighting to the people who do the transportation to the, uh, the um, catering people to, uh, you know, the stand-ins, all those people, after five years, they have to find another job. And in nonfiction TV, the jobs are even shorter. You know, I mean, they'll go six months. They'll go four months. Uh, for editors, they might go, you might have a show, you get you get called in to edit, two months, you're done. So um, you're always looking for work. And the reason unions are so important in, in, in these creative professions is how are you going to get health insurance? How are you going to get a pension when you're working two months at a time? Um, and you're constantly looking for work. And, and... It's just how things go there. It's not, you know, nothing to complain about. People are used to it. I was used to it. I was a freelancer for many years, and I guess I sort of am again. And um, you just, you totally get used to it. You get used to budgeting your money and and putting away a certain amount and, and, you know, understanding that you are going to be, there's a chance you'll be unemployed. You know, people, people who are very good work all the time because people know they're very good. And then a lot of producers and production companies are very loyal. You know, if one show ends, they'll try to move a, a producer or an editor to another show. But people don't understand this about Hollywood. They don't understand that the majority of people working on these shows are really worker bees. And um, that's a frustrating thing about reality TV, too, is one of the things that's come out since I wrote the novel. Um, friends of mine from years back, a number of them. I mean, you know, a number enough to be a like a you know a market research group have contacted me and said, you know, God, thank God you wrote this novel. I, I'd be afraid to say the things you said in the novel, but because I, you know, I'm still working in reality TV. I hate it. I'm embarrassed by what I do. I go home feeling horrible about myself. But you know, I've got two kids in college. You know, I've got a mortgage. I'm 50 years old. I can't start a new career. You know, it's it's. The industry changes. It's always been changing. You know, the silent film era changed. The you know when the silent films ended, huge you know huge sea change. Whole rich people, companies, stars gone. You know, careers gone overnight. Um, Always in Hollywood, it's been a a change with technology, with public taste, 
with uh, methods of production, you know, we've, we've all had to adapt to changes, and it, 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 there's no point in bemoaning, you know, the good old days. But I think that there are certain things that you need to shine a light on when they're really hurting people. Now, there's an entire peripheral industry, uh, Melissa, built up around the average reality TV show, from paparazzi photographers to magazine and online publishing companies regurgitating, you know, the latest gossip surrounding one show or another, right down to the camera crew, production teams, uh, the people running around with luggage and equipment and and so on. Uh, How do you combat an industry that is now so ingrained in world culture? Or do you? Do you not just throw your hands up in the air and either give up uh, or even join the ranks? If well, you're, if I you're think in a lot product. of people have, have joined the ranks, and you have, a, you, know, you have a decision to make. How are you going to join the ranks or how are you not? Um, I know a lot of people uh, from my era of production who've just left the business. A lot of people who've just said, you know, this isn't what I signed up for. And they've, they've had to reinvent themselves in completely new areas, you know. Uh, and it's, as you know, in this economy, to do that at, you know, age 40 to 60 is really hard. But I know a lot of people who've done that. They just don't, they, they can't bear this. Um, I'm sort of in between there. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to work on more fictional stuff. Because I figure if you're going to do fiction, you might as well do good fiction. <laughs> you know, not paint by numbers, stereotypical, you know, storylines. Um, and I'm, I still do types of reality TV that I consider um, fair and honest um, and and unharmful. But um, you know, not everybody has that option, um, and they have to take the work that's available, especially if they're living in LA and. Um, and so, yeah, if you can't beat them, join them, and some people have to join them. And there's a whole generation coming up who are starting in television who have never known anything but the way things are. So they join them. I don't think you combat change. I don't think there's any reason to combat change. Change happens in Hollywood. Trends happen and trends end. They begin and they end. I was, um, my husband also, I mean, we went through the whole heyday of, of the TV movie, which the TV movie toward the end got to be almost cannibalistic, you know, you know, running around to get the rights of the next true story that was, you know, the next whatever. I mean, it, it's just how it works. I, I'm not somebody who, who wants to rail against how wrong or evil it is or anything because I don't think it is. I think it's just phases of, of pop culture. Um, but I do, again, I, I really want people to think about it. I think if you had more audience members, uh, you know, more parents sitting down with their kids when they sit down to watch Jersey Shore and saying, well, you know, do you think they'd be having this fight if they weren't drinking all night? You know, do you think that that it's a good thing for friends to be fighting like this? Do you think it's a good thing for people to be stealing each other's boyfriends? I mean, to actually ask them questions about the validity of the behavior they're seeing. We all love to see, you know, train wrecks, and we all love to see people who are, or you know, as one of the uh, producers in um, in my novel says, you know, more screwed up than I am. But um, but let's. Let's, especially with kids, let's, let's have them think critically about it. You know, let, let them enjoy it because it's so fun to watch. Everybody enjoys watching sort of guilty pleasure stuff. Let's ha- allow them to enjoy it, but let's give them a perspective on it. Let's give them a, a, a context for it. And the other thing I would like to do is to ask people who are in the business to really think about what you're putting on the air. You know, the networks are, are designed to make profits and they're designed to get ratings. But, my gosh, you know, you're, you're creating these you're, – you're creating the zeitgeist as much as you're, rea- you're reacting to it. You know, the, the, there's a phrase we're just giving people what they want, but I really believe that we tell people what they want and then we convince them, and then we give it to them. And um, I I just wish that people in power positions could take the time, and I know how hard it is to do that. And I know, again, you know, when I was in the midst of it, I was not as cognizant of these factors. Um, I would like people to just really think about the fact that you have this incredibly powerful medium at your fingertips. You have the power to affect so many lives. 
you know, you, you could affect them positively or you could affect them negatively or you could just entertain them. You do have that choice. Well, Melissa, it has been a great pleasure having this chat with you about the inner workings of your new novel, Reality Boulevard, and we wish you great success with the book, which is available online now. How do our Radio Irish listeners get their hands on a copy, Melissa? Well, you can get it on Amazon. You can get it on Barnes & Noble Nook. You can get it on Kobo if you're a Kobo reader. Um, You can get it on iBooks if you have an iPad. Um, If you don't have an e-reader... You can download a free Kindle app to your computer and read it just like it's a book on your computer. Um, You know, I I would love for enough copies to sell for it to go to to, uh, trade paperback or hardcover. Um, And you can also go to my website, which is um, www.melissajopeltier.com. And I have uh, a lot of the other publicity I've done for the book. And on my blog page, I have a huge list of incredible reading books and articles about reality TV that will help you if you want to watch reality TV with your kids and, and teach them to think a little more critically about it. Thank you so very much for joining us here on Radio Irish, Melissa. Oh, you're very welcome. Always such a pleasure to talk to you, Sean. Slancha. Slancha, Melissa. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Emmy and Peabody Award-winning film and television producer, writer, director and author Melissa Jo Peltier there on Radio Irish, filling us in on the background of her new novel, out now and titled Reality Boulevard, which follows fictional Oscar-winning producer Marty Maltzman, whose award-winning non-fiction TV show is suddenly cancelled after 16 seasons. <laughs> and it's an extremely insightful look at the world of reality television, packaged in a highly entertaining fictional wrapper that has some of the industry's top names applauding it and recommending that you buy yourself a copy and sit back and relax. And enjoy it, Reality Boulevard. So take your own stroll down Reality Boulevard today. If you're curious about the goings-on behind the phenomenon that is reality television. Soft scripts, huh? That's a new one to me. I've never heard of that. They kind of just ad-lib along the way. And you can visit Melissa at melissajopeltier.com. And it's a very active and full website. This is Sean McCarthy here on America's only Irish station. Live from New York City, RadioIrish.com.